Hi, I'm Ellen from EVPL Oakland. Welcome to Chapter Book Storytime. On this week's edition of the Variety Pack, I have a science fiction novel to share with you. It's called The Lion of Mars by Jennifer Holm. Jennifer has written a lot of books for young people, uh, including The 14th Goldfish and its sequel, The Third Mushroom. And both of those books have science fiction elements to them as well. Also, she's written with her brother, Matthew, the graphic novel series, Baby Mouse, and also the Squish series. And she also created the uh, Sunny Side Up graphic novel series. So you might see her name around the library a lot. And uh, this book I really, really like. I like science fiction, it's fun. Um, science fiction is part of a larger category of fiction called speculative fiction. So you're speculating, you're thinking, what if? What if there were a colony of children on Mars? What could happen? How would they survive on that planet? So it's speculating. Also, in science fiction, uh, there's a heavy dependence on technology. So there could be a theme of technology gone wrong or technology that we don't have yet, what would be really cool to have. Where are those flying cars, by the way? We haven't gotten them yet. Also, it could be technology given to us by someone from another planet, an extraterrestrial being. The characters in a, in a science fiction novel might be human. They might not. So let's take a look at The Lion of Mars. Chapter One, Nest. The trip to Mars was the hardest thing they'd ever experienced. That's what all the grown-ups said. The small cramped ship, the constant fear of something going wrong, the knowledge that they would never return to Earth. But honestly, it sounded like a cakewalk compared to sharing a bedroom with Albie because he snored. I hadn't had a decent night's sleep since Albie started bunking with me. I tried just about everything to block the noise. Earplugs, sleeping under the blanket, even a thick hat with ear flaps. But none of them worked. It was surprising because Albie was perfect. He was easygoing and he did his chores without complaining. Of all us kids, he was the least likely to raise a fuss. The grown-ups trusted him, even Sigh. But it turned out there was one thing Albie wasn't good at sleeping quietly. And I didn't know which was worse, Albie snoring or Trey wanting to change rooms. For as long as I could remember, Trey had slept in the bed across from mine. My drawings of cats and his drawings of aliens had papered the walls. Our plastic models crowded the shelves together. Then, two months ago, Trey suddenly asked to switch bedrooms. Next thing I knew, Trey was sleeping across the hall in the older kids' room with Vera and Flossie while Albie was snoring in mine. And me? I wasn't sleeping at all. Neither was Leo from the looks of it. The old cat was sitting up in bed, flicking its tail in annoyance. This room switching thing had happened once before. Back when Trey and I were little, the grown-ups had moved us boys into one room and the girls into the other. Albie was older than me and Trey, so he was allowed to stay up later. The problem was that Albie would make a lot of noise when he came to bed, and he'd wake us up. The experiment was abandoned after a week. Now, all these years later, Albie was keeping me awake again. Across from me, Albie let out a long, waffling snort. I groaned, pulling the pillow up over my head. Albie, I said. He didn't move. Albie, I shouted. He sat up abruptly, looking around the dimly lit room in confusion. Albie was tall, with broad shoulders. Darby said he would have made a good football player. Football was an earth game where you threw around a ball and knocked into people. I really didn't understand it. What's wrong, Belle? Albie asked, his hair sticking out crazily everywhere. It was funny to see him without his Dodgers ball cap. He only took it off at bedtime. You're snoring, I said. Oh, he said, I thought there was an emergency. It is an emergency. I can't sleep. Oh, I'm so sorry, Belle, he mumbled and lay back down. I promise not to snore anymore. It was hard to be angry at Albie. He was kind and gentle. A big teddy bear when he came right down to it. A big snoring teddy bear. 
Ah, dust it, I muttered. Albie could have the room to himself. I grabbed my blanket and left, Leo paddling after me. Not that I blamed him. Even a cat couldn't take Albie snoring. Leo and I walked down the twisting corridor, our way lit by the cool blue light of nighttime. The light changed to mirror the time of day. In the morning, the blue would transform to a warm, bright yellow. This was supposed to help us have a sense of time because the settlement was mostly underground. It had been built in a giant lava tube, a massive cave-like space left behind by flowing lava millions of years ago. It was the perfect pre-built habitat, keeping us safe from the surface dangers of Mars. Radiation, extreme freezing temperatures, and dust. The interior walls were constructed from a space tech gray rubber that curved gently, flowing from one room to the next with like a smile. The rooms were round, almost bubble-like, for improved structure, structural integrity. Sai told me he'd thrown out all the rules when he designed the settlement. Apparently on Earth, people lived in boxy structures with hard corners. Earth sounded sharp to me. This corridor was a history of my childhood. There was the spot where I banged into the wall with my scooter. The scratches on the ceiling from when I tried to make my toy spaceship fly. It didn't work. And of course the ruler on the wall where memes recorded our growth with a thick black pen. She joked that as some of the first human children to grow up on Mars, we were a living experiment. Farther down the way was a board with digipics of what us when we'd arrived on Mars. We were much older now than the babies on the wall. Albie was 17, the oldest in Earth years. Then came Flossie, 16, Vera, 15, Trey, 14, and me, 11. I might have been the youngest, but at least I still knew how to have fun. I like the older kids who'd become moody grumps when they turned 13. Of course, in Mars years, we were much younger. It takes Mars 687 days to go around the sun. So a Mars year is 687 days, which means I was only five and Trey was seven. Ahead of me, Leo stopped to sniff at something, his tail flicking in the air. When I was little, there had been a lot of cats. Bella, Moki, Harley, Sesame, little cat. As the years went by, the cats died and Leo was the only one left. But I still remembered them all. Then Leo and I were leaving the children's wing and passing the shared areas, the recreation room and the mess hall and the kitchen. That book ended at the two sleeping wings. The recreation room was illuminated by the flickering light of a digi reel that someone had left playing. Like the rest of the settlement, the room was painted a pale blue. It was supposed to be a soothing color that mimicked the earth sky. There was an L-shaped couch with a loop rug woven from old clothing. Darby had created the rocking chair from plastic barrels. Everything was recycled on Mars. Even the plant that decorated the room was made from algae paper, although it was getting old and the leaves had become brittle and started to crumble. Aside from the couch and the rocking chair, there was the small plastic table we had played at when we were little. These days, it held Flossie's sewing machine and fabric instead of clay and crayons. Then there was a plastic display case next to the wall, which housed the rocks we children had collected over the years. After that was the mess hall. It smelled like tonight's supper, an algae casserole that was one of Salty Bill's standard meals. No one was around, so I made a quick stop in the kitchen and grabbed a few ginger cookies. Salty Bill didn't like anyone taking food when he wasn't there, but I figured he wouldn't miss them. Then I was in the grown-up's wing. First was Meme's room. I could find my way to it with my eyes closed. When we woke up sick at night, she was the one we went to. Past it was Salty Bill's room. Across from it was Phineas's room. As I passed Eliana and Darby's room, I could hear soft snoring. Eliana had always complained about her husband's snoring, but I never understood what she was talking about. I sure did now. Everyone's rooms were dark except for Sai's. There was light under his door, and I wondered what kept him from sleep. I left the living quarters behind and followed the corridor that led to the work areas. This part of the settlement was usually buzzing with activity during the day, but in the middle of the night, the only sound was from the air scrubbers humming softly in the background like a lullaby. I passed the exercise room, size workshop, the sick bay, various work rooms, the generator room, and my favorite, 
the algae farm. Just past the algae farm was a circular staircase. I climbed up and up and up the bouncing plastic stairs. I was a little out of breath when I finally reached the communications and observations room, also known as COR, CORE. It was above ground and where we sent and received messages from Earth. The grown-ups jokingly called it the phone booth. The COR was the crew's original habitat when they'd first arrived on Mars. Installed by robots, it was a simple dome-like structure. There was a wide window with a sweeping view of the dusty red Martian landscape. No one spent much time here, except for Psy. As commander, he sent situation reports to Earth Command. Also, he would monitor the weather better up there. It was the perfect spot to watch swirling dust devils. I settled on the couch under the blanket and munched on the cookies. Outside the wide window, Phobos, one of our two moons, was a glowing lump in the darkness. Above it was Earth, a bright shining star. I wondered if the people on Earth thought about us as much as we did about them. Even though I'd seen lots of digipics, I still had a hard time imagining Earth. The pool of ender endless water called the ocean, the places with trees called forests, and of course the animals. Phineas had told me about the birds that flew through the sky and made their homes called nests in high trees trees high above the ground. As I closed my eyes with Leo curled at my feet, I felt like a bird in a quiet, safe nest. My home. One that I never, ever wanted to leave. Chapter 2. A Good Day. I blinked my eyes open. The dome was bathed in warm pink light. It was morning, and there was something heavy on my chest. Meow! That something was Leo. He was sitting on me. Meow, he said again more loudly. I understood a little cat, and that meant I'm hungry. I guess you want breakfast, I said. Satisfied that I was finally awake, he leapt off me with a swish of his tail, landing with a soft thud on the floor. I stood up and yawned, walking over to the window. The landscape stretched out in varying shades of dusty red as far as I could see. The low-hanging sun was a small dot against a pink sky with wispy blue clouds. Sunrise on Mars was magical. Something caught my eye. A blinking light was moving slowly across the horizon. It was probably a rover from one of the other countries. It was always a little scary to think of how close those other settlements were to us. I sometimes wondered what they looked like, as I'd never seen them. We weren't allowed to go past the little cemetery on the edge of our territory. It was far too dangerous. There was a soft ringing in the distance. It was the meal chime. Salty Bill would be setting breakfast out now. After that would be morning chores, lessons, lunch, then afternoon chores, free time, supper, then evening chores, and finally, bed. The next morning we would wake up and start the same routine all over again. Sai liked to say a boring day on Mars was a good day. We better get moving, Leo, I said. Um yums. That was a baby word that I had used for food. Now I used it on Leo. He knew that word and turned toward me. But before I could take a step, it happened. A glowing round object hurtled across the sky, a white hot tail of light streaking behind it. It crashed far away, waves of bright light exploding around it like a halo. Leo darted under the couch right before the room began to shake. All around me, the room rocked wildly. I tumbled to the ground. Across the room, the desk holding the communications digislate rattled, and the chair in front of it tipped over with a loud crash. Papers on the desk spilled across the floor, and a locker banged open. I decided to stay where I was. It seemed like the safest thing to do. Then, as suddenly as it had started, it was over. Everything was still. I crawled to the window and looked out. A plume of red dust was rising, as if it had been kicked up by whatever had crashed into it. The question was, what had crashed? It had looked like a ship, but not like any ship I had ever seen. It was too round, too glowing, too otherworldly, too alien. Feet pounded up the stairs. Sai burst into the room, worry etched into the, into the lines of his face. He must have been in the middle of shaving. He had green shaving cream on one cheek. Are you hurt? He demanded. 
I shook my head and then remembered, Leo, I cried, looking around. Scrambling down onto my hands and knees, I peered under the couch. Leo was curled into a tight loaf and stared back at me. I tugged him out, checking him over. He seemed fine. Then people were running into the room. Darby and Eliana, Trey, Flossie, Vera, and Albie. Albie looked half awake, his ball cap on backward. Sit rep, Cy barked. It was short for situation report and was a way of asking what had happened. Something crashed, I said, pointing out the window. I think it was an alien ship. Everyone looked at me as if I was an alien. Everyone except Trey. He and I had always been fascinated by aliens and monsters. We had watched every digi reel in our collection that featured them. Alien? Trey asked, his eyes widening. I nodded. Bell, Cy said, shaking his head. There's no such thing as aliens. Technically, he was right. We had colonized the moon and begun to settle Mars. In all that time, we hadn't encountered alien life. But I knew aliens existed. Why wouldn't there be something else besides us out there? It just made sense. There were hundreds of billions of galaxies. Surely one of them had intelligent life. Maybe even alien cats? Memes ran in, carrying her portable med kit. She was wearing her bathrobe, and her short gray hair was wet and plastered onto her head. What happened? She asked urgently. Something crashed, Flossie said. He thinks it was an alien ship, Trey added. It was definitely an alien ship, I said. Memes pushed her way forward with her med kit, her pale eyes filled with worry. Did you hit your head, Bill? She asked, her hand in my hair, feeling for bumps. No, I said, shaking her off. I'm fine. But this silly talk of aliens. I saw the ship. Describe exactly what you saw, she said, like I was describing symptoms. She was our doctor, after all. So I did. I described the circle of light, the bright white tail, the explosion, how everything shook, and Leo was terrified. I see, she said and looked up at Cy. Cy was rubbing his gray beard, which he did when he was trying to puzzle something out. There were still bits of shaving cream on his face, but he didn't seem to notice. Sounds like a meteorite, Eliana said. She was wearing her usual cargo shorts and a t-shirt. She liked to wear shorts because she was in and out of environmental suits all day and got hot. But it glowed, I said. Well, that's what meteors do when they enter the atmosphere, she explained. Let me through, a voice called loudly. Phineas was pushing up to the front with his cane. He was old and moved slowly, but he had a way of making himself heard. He walked to the window and stared out at the plume of dust. Whatever it was, it landed near the French settlement, Phineas said, pointing his cane. We need to contact them to see if they're all right. Absolutely not, said Sai in a firm voice, crossing his arms. Sigh, Meme said, maybe we should go take a look. It's not our territory. It's not our problem. You know the rules. There were a lot of rules. They said it was because Mars was dangerous. I knew them by heart. We all did. They were impossible to miss. The grown-ups had taped them in front of the toilet in our bathroom. Settlement rules. Do not go outside without a buddy. Use the alarm bell in an emergency. Keep a glow stick in your pocket. Rovers are off limits for children. Do not go beyond the flag. No contact with foreign countries, ever. Beneath the type rules, somebody, probably Vera, had added. Always put the seat down on the toilet. Vera, who never missed a chance to argue, asked, Why can't we go see what it is? Because it's too dangerous, Sai said. Yeah, it's too dangerous. Albie echoed. Oh, you just say whatever Sai says, Vera snapped at him. What if someone's hurt? Phineas asked. And then everyone started talking at once, the voices getting louder and louder, until I couldn't tell who was speaking. A loud whistle pierced the noise. I turned to see Salty Bill standing in the doorway, wearing his apron and holding a plastic whistle. He had a kerchief tied over his head and his long gray ponytail dangled beneath. What's a ruckus? He hollered as the room fell silent. 
An alien ship crashed over there, I said. It was a meteorite, Sai said. Salty Bill just shook his head. I don't care if a pterodactyl flew out of a black hole and landed here. I'm serving breakfast in five minutes. It's the only meal you're getting until lunch, he announced. Salty Bill turned and stomped out of the room. Everyone looked around it for a minute and then followed him out. Aliens or no aliens, no one ever missed a meal on Mars. Was it an alien or was it a meteorite? What do you think? Sounds like Mars is a very interesting place to live. I don't know if I'd like to live there, but it sounds like the people in the colony for the United States have made it their home. But why can't they interact with the other countries and their colonies? I wonder why. Sounds very interesting. Hmm. Did you notice the list of rules? Don't go outside. Carry a glow stick. No contact with foreign countries. I wonder why not. That's always strange. Why didn't you think they'd want to help each other out on Mars, since it's a pretty dangerous place? Hmm. But what I do know is, anytime in a book somebody posts rules that you're not allowed to break, somebody breaks them. Chapter 4, Secrets and Gifts. After lunch, I sat in my room and searched for carrot cake recipes on my digi slate. Vera pushed her head in the door. Psst! Bell, she said, come on over to our room. Why? It's a secret. A secret? Nobody could keep a secret on Mars. I'm kind of busy, I told her. Come on, she said, and grabbed my arm, tugging me across the hall. I was pretty sure she was the bossiest person on Mars. Hey, Bell, Trey said, glancing up from the game he was playing on his digi slate. He looked almost happy to see me. What's up? I asked. So, we need your help, Vera said. My help? We want to go see the spaceship, she said. You're the only one who saw it fall. You can show us where it is. Doesn't that sound fun? Fun? Were they kidding me? It's dangerous to go near the other settlements, I said. One of our crew members, a woman named Lissa, had died near the French settlement. I was a little unclear on what had happened because none of the grown-ups liked to talk about it. She was buried in the cemetery with the cats. Yes, yes, it's so dangerous, blah, 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 Vera said, rolling her eyes. Look, how bad can it be? The grown-ups used to work with the other countries. How do you think the rail tunnel got built? It was an international thing. I shook my head, my stomach churning. No way, we'll get in so much trouble. Remember all the times we talked about alien ships? Trey asked me. I nodded. Of course I remembered. Well, now's our chance to actually see one in real life. Trey said, his voice urgent. We'll take the rover and go after lunch tomorrow. Be back by supper. No one will even know we're gone. But it'll be fun, Trey promised. An adventure. And for a moment, it seemed like the old Trey the one I shared a room with, the one who knew everything about me, my best friend. Come on, he said. Ah, dust it. I never stood a chance. Okay, I said. Flossie burst through the door, a smile on her face. So, are you coming with us to see the alien ship tomorrow? She asked me. I still haven't decided what I'm going to wear. Flossie, Vera said. Like I said, it was impossible to keep a secret on Mars. Chapter 5, The Rules My hands shook as I tugged on my bulky environmental suit. I could barely pull up the zipper. I was too anxious because I couldn't believe we were actually doing this. Sure, we'd done some dumb things in the past. Well, mostly Vera had, but never anything this bad. This was going against every single rule we'd ever learned. No one else seemed scared, though. Flossie and Vera and Trey looked excited as they stepped into their suits. When they rushed through the airlock to the garage, I hung back. Did I really want to do this? Aside from getting in trouble with the grown-ups, this was dangerous. Those digi-reels with aliens always ended badly, usually with someone getting eaten. What if the alien had tentacles? I didn't want to be around one of those guys. Trey stuck his head through the door. Aren't you coming? he asked. I swallowed hard. 
Uh, yeah, just, just getting zipped up, I said, following him to the garage, where Flossie and Vera were arguing next to the Enterprise. The Enterprise was the smaller of our two rovers. The bigger rover was called the Yellow Submarine and was actually painted yellow. Sometimes I didn't get the old names the grown-ups gave things. Trey and I got into the back seats and strapped on our four-point safety harnesses. Then the garage door slid open and we were moving. Everyone was quiet as we drove through the settlement, passing the small, sad graveyard where Lissa and the cats were buried. It was like we were all holding our breath, just waiting to get caught. But nothing happened. Nobody stopped us. When we passed the flag that marked the edge of our territory, Vera hooted. Here we go, she shouted as she steered over the bumpy Mars terrain. But all I could think of was how many rules we were breaking. Correction, how many rules we had already broken. So far they were, rovers are off limits for children. Do not go beyond the flag. Are we going the right way, Belle? Flossie asked me. I tried to remember the way the ship had raced across the sky to the west. This seemed right. Yes. It wasn't too long before we saw a blue and white flag. There's Finland, Trey said. It was the closest settlement to ours, and I'd never seen the inside of it. I'm pretty sure we're going to pass right by the French settlement, Vera said. Oh, I watched a French digi-reel. All the girls looked so stylish. They were these scarves around their neck, Flossie said. Trey looked at me, and even through his helmet, I could see him rolling his eyes. I stared at the landscape. I never got tired of looking at it. There were gently sloping sand dunes and deep canyons, mountains, craters, and towering hills with jagged outcrops. Right now, we were driving across a plain studded with rocks. The sky was a yellowish brown, a color Eliana called butterscotch after an earth candy. As the rover bounced along, my stomach churned. I had a bad taste in my mouth and felt queasy. Ah, oh, dust it. I was rover sick. Are we almost there? I asked. That's what the kids always say in the Earth Digi Reels, Belle, Flossie said, amused. Did Earth kids barf in car vehicles? Because I felt like I was going to do just that any minute now. Oh, I feel sick, I said. Sick how? Flossie asked. Rover sick, I admitted. Oh, that's just great, Vera said, and sighed. Finally, after what seemed like forever, Flossie pointed excitedly. I see it, she said. That's the French flag. Up ahead, there was a round pod of a habitat. A red, white, and blue flag fluttered from a pole. Let's get closer, Vera said. I looked at Trey and shook my head, mouthing, no. I could tell he didn't think it was a good idea either. Uh, we're not allowed to visit the other countries, Trey said. We aren't allowed to take the rover either, but here we are, Vera replied. Vera pulled the rover alongside the habitat so that we could look in the hexagon-shaped windows, but there were no lights on. Where is everyone? Vera asked. Probably under, underground, Trey said. Oh, that's too bad. I really wanted to see a French person, Vera said. We had never seen anyone from a foreign territory in real life. Well, I really wanted to see the scarves, Flossie said, disappointed. I took a deep breath, staring out my window. Now that we weren't moving, I was starting to feel a little better. That is until I saw a person in the environmental suit walking toward us. They were carrying something long and metal with a curved end, which looked like a weapon. Uh, I said. My mouth couldn't seem to work right. Do you think they look like us? Trey asked. Of course they do, Vera said. Well, how do you know? I've seen digipics. Me too, Trey said. Me three, I said. Except they wear cute scarves, Flossie added. Another person in an enviro suit joined the first one and had a long metal thing too. That person turned and shook their metal thing at our rover. They look just like that, I shouted, pointing out my window. Trey gasped. The people shuffle hopped toward us, gesturing angrily and waving their weapons. They don't seem very friendly, Trey said. I think we should go, Flossie said. Now! Right, said Vera, fumbling with the, co fumbling with the controls. It's in park, Flossie said. Put it in drive. I'm trying, Vera said. Hurry, I urged. They're coming. 
It wasn't fast enough because they had already reached the rover and were banging on my window. I looked into the face glaring at me from behind the helmet. It was a man. He looked angry. Fear rushed through me. Move! Let me do it! Flossie yelled, leaning over and knocking Vera's hand away. She shifted the gear, gear into the reverse. Suddenly, we were driving backward, the French people chasing us. Then Vera turned sharply, and we were driving forward, away from the French settlement. I looked anxiously behind us until the figures were just specks on the horizon. And then finally, nothing at all. The inside of the rover was quiet as it bumped along. No one was talking or laughing. All the excitement had escaped, like air draining from a balloon. I couldn't stop shaking. All I could think was that we had broken another rule. No contact with foreign countries, ever. Was having them chase us technically considered contact? It wasn't like we talked to them or been invited over for supper. What was that thing they were waving at us? Flossie asked. Some kind of weapon, Vera said. Maybe a sword, like from Earth ancient times? Trey suggested. I looked out the window and down at the steep sand dune cliff we were driving on top of. I took a deep breath, but it didn't help because I couldn't shake the fear anymore. It clung to me like a second skin. I want to go home, I blurted out, blurted out. You do, Trey asked. Yes, I said, and he must have seen the fear in my eyes. Okay, he said, nodding slowly. No way, Vera said. We came all this way. Besides, we're close to the crash site. I think we should take a vote. I vote we go home, said Flossie. Me too, said Trey. Me three, I said. Vera turned to look back at us. There was a furious expression on her face. This isn't fair. We took a vote, Vera, Flossie said. Well, I'm the one driving and I say. But she never finished her sentence. The next thing I knew, we were rolling over and my helmet smacked the window hard and everything turned black. When I opened my eyes, the rover was on its side and everyone was yelling, and all I could do was gasp because of the pain in my shoulder. It felt like it was on fire. You drove right over the edge, Vera, Flossie said. It wasn't my fault, Vera shrieked. Her voice seemed even louder in my helmet. Are you hurt, Belle? Trey asked in a panicky voice. I tried to say something, but when I moved, sharp pain arced through my shoulder. I screamed. Belle's hurt. Trey shouted. Everyone stay calm. Just stay calm, Flossie said. Shouting won't help anything. I am calm, he snapped at her. Flossie turned to look at me. Where does it hurt, Belle? My, my shoulder, I said with a whimper. Get me out. The harness hurts, Trey asked. Yes. Hold on, he said. Trey undid his harness and scrambled over, looking at mine. He unlatched it, and my body felt forward toward the ground, hitting the side of the rover. I yelped in pain. Are you okay, Belle? Vera asked. What do you think? I huffed. We need to call for help now. Well, unless someone happened to steal a Digicom, we're all out of luck, Flossie said. Only the grown-ups had Digicom devices. We all looked at Vera. She was the sneakiest one of us. I didn't take one, she said, throwing up her hands. Of all the times for Vera to be good. Ah, dust it, I whispered. As their voices filled the rover, I closed my eyes. The grown-ups had been right all along. Mars was dangerous. If we got out of this alive, I would never, ever break a rule again. Then something banged hard against the rover, and Flossie screamed. Don't worry, it's not the French. It's Psy. Turns out the rover has a tracking device on it. So once the adults found out that the kids were missing, they were easy to find. They head back to the colony. Turns out that Belle has a broken collarbone and a concussion. And so while he's in bed healing, the other three kids get extra chores. I wonder if they think it was worth it to head out in the rover. Pretty exciting story, isn't it? And let me tell you, the meteorite or the alien ship and the rover accident aren't the most exciting things or the most dangerous things that happen in the book. A virus gets into the colony, but only the adults get sick. It's up to the kids to use everything they know to keep the adults alive and to keep the colony going. 
This is The Lion of Mars by Jennifer L. Holm. It's available at EVPL as a print book at many of our branches. Thank you for joining me this week for Chapter Book Storytime. Come on into the library and we'll help you find The Lion of Mars or maybe some books by Jennifer Holm or even we can even point you in the direction of other science fiction books. We'll be glad to help. Have a good day. Bye-bye.